If you're confused by the tongues, it uh, of course comes from the, the Hebrew. And on the very bottom, you can do a little eye test, see how well you can see. Number 36, hymn number 36. El Shaddai, God Almighty. El Elyon, the Most High God. Uh, Na Adonai, O Lord. And Erkakah, Er. Come, Ka, we will love you. So I want to make sure you know what you're singing. Let's stand and sing twice, number 36. to him 26 a mighty fortress is our god <laughs> Yeah. 
privilege it is to sing the words that were written by the founder of the Protestant movement, Martin Luther. And so we are uh, very privileged to have this treasure of the church because of his willingness to die, to stand up for the truth. Amen. And uh, I want to be so committed that I would be willing to say, what's the worst they can do is kill the body. They can ruin your reputation. They can do whatever. But God's truth abides forever and ever. That one word above all earthly powers. You know what that word was? I read that he told them what that one word is. It's liar. Liar. Satan is a liar. And truth will expose Satan as a liar. That one word will fail him. You are a liar because I know the truth and you are a liar. If you believe those words, we invite you to recite the Apostles' Creed. It's on the back of your bulletin if you need the exact form that we use. Say it with us. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is sitting on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the one universal church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you that when we put things to song, or we put things to memory that we recite over and over again, that it, it helps us to retain those things and to remember in such a, a powerful way. That's only true if we allow the reality to sink in. It's not just something we memorize or something we say together. So thank you, Father, for the presence of your Holy Spirit that we can say we know for sure these things are so. And we know it because you have revealed them to us by your Holy Spirit through the inspired words of the Bible. And thank you, Father, that we recognize, as the Bible says, the natural man cannot know the things of the Spirit of God because they are spiritually discerned. It takes a spiritual connection in order to make hide or tell of, of the Bible. And so thank you, Father, for the presence of your Holy Spirit. Thank you that you're not only here when we gather in that special presence where two or three are gathered seeking truth, but you're here with us who have believed through Christ, you're here with us always, wherever we are, wherever we go, whether we feel it or not. And we just thank you for that reality. We pray that today would be a day to help to strengthen our faith. And Father, may it be a day to challenge those who don't truly have faith, that don't believe in you through Christ. We pray that this would be the day, at least seeds planted in the hearts of people that will bear fruit in the future. Thank you, Father, for this opportunity, for this place to assemble. We ask your protection of all that we do today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And thank you. you. May be seated. Happy Father's Day to those that that applies to. If it doesn't apply to you, you had a father. <laughs> and so it applies to all of us in one way or another, doesn't it? And some of you get to sit by your father. Some of you get to hug your dad when you come through the door, even if you don't get to sit with him. And uh, for those whose dads are in heaven, my uh, son-in-law Nate sent me a little text telling me Happy Father's Day, and he mentioned our fathers all of our fathers, Andrew's father, my father, and Nate's father are all gone and in heaven. And uh, we are thankful for the heritage of our fathers that aren't with us anymore. If you have yours, take advantage of it. 
If you had one that surrendered his life to Christ and was seeking to be the kind of father that he knew God wanted him to be, rejoice in that fact. If you didn't, rejoice in all the good that was there that God made possible. And so we thank you, fathers, for all that you do and all that you mean to us. Yes, thank you, Pam, for helping us celebrate this morning. Helping us. Yeah, we had a we had a great fellowship. There's some of the leftovers still back there in honor of the fathers this morning before Sunday school. Uh, we told Zane happy birthday. It's his birthday today. So or he's stealing some of the thunder from the Father's Day celebration. <laughs> uh, we're thankful for him. Are there any? Amen. Wow. <laughs> if y'all don't know who Terry Franklin is, you've, you've heard me read cards from her, and she's thanking us for the Zoom, and she's not on Zoom today. She's actually here in person, so that's exciting. That's wonderful. So we hope that happens to all of our folks on Zoom eventually as they all show up here in church, but uh, we, we're thankful for that, for Zoom, that option when you need it. Do we have any other announcements? I would like to make a quick announcement. Sure. Uh, Bible school, of course, it has been announced that it's going to be July 12th through 16th. And we have registration forms that need to be filled out. And I was telling my two grandchildren who are going to be helpers that they too need to fill out this information at the bottom. It's medical information that needs signed. If you go to an elementary school, junior high, or high school, there are forms that always have to be filled out because it's a procedure to make sure that we have a source to go to should something happen. So I'm asking everybody that's going to be involved to take one of these up. Last year we had a form where we could put all of the kids on one page. Well, that's not the case this year. One page for each kid. Okay? And it's Cindy grades K through uh, six. Six grade, yeah. And I'm going to have this not back there because we have a food there now, but it will be back there on that counter <clears throat> next Sunday. For this Sunday, I'll probably put it over by that door. Thank you, Lorna. Thank you, Lorna. Great job with registration. I'm so grateful. Yes. <laughs> Amen. It. Cindy was excited. The turnout last Tuesday for uh, VBS preparation. She was so encouraged by that, how many people showed up and all the volunteers to help. So thank you if you were part of that. And if you weren't, I know you'll come to Cindy and say, where, where can I help if you can? Anything else? Any other announcements? John David. Uh, this Thursday, 7-15, we're going to have our monthly men's meeting here at the church for any men who would like to join us. All right. The time adjusted for reality, right? We, <laughs> we meet after the board meeting, so we finally adjusted the time to to what's normally taking place anyway. Yes, Cindy. Uh, we are needing the baby bottles back. So if you took a baby bottle to fill it for the share center, it looks like we're missing about 18. So wow. if you have a bottle, oh, 12. That's right, we're missing 12. So please bring it by next <coughs> Sunday because we are going to send those to the share center. We appreciate it. And then second, we're having a shower. For Annette Gonzalez, our, our sweet little girl who's grown up now and she is getting married. And so we would love to have all you ladies come stay next Sunday and pray in the shower. So just to let you know. Amen. If you lost your baby bottle, just write a big check and they'll forget about it. So, <laughs> for the Share Center. Very worthy organization. Anyone else? Announcements? Uh, we've come to our prayer time in the service. If you're new and we're so thankful we have visitors today, we appreciate them being here. But we stand if you have a special need. We're not going to have you say what it is. We just want you to stand if you want us to pray for you about a specific need that's on your heart right now. Go ahead and stand. And we'll take names and we'll... Publish that on an email church-wide so that people will be praying for you all week. 
right, let's pray. Lord, thank you for these who are standing. We know that in this world where sin is present, sin's environment that you're dealing so perfectly with, that we run into difficulty and heartache and loss and physical challenges and all the things that we could mention. Most importantly, we know that there are people out there that don't know you. And we pray for them right now. Someone may be standing for a loved one that's lost or someone who's just made a commitment like many of them in our youth camp last week. We pray, Father, that they would be strong, that they would be strengthened. They'd find a place of encouragement either in a local church or through somebody who knows you and is growing in you that will help them along the way. Uh, be with each need that's represented by these who are standing. Bless, move by your Holy Spirit, comfort, and bring healing. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Everybody else join them as we sing number 279. Let's stand. <clears throat> Ushers come forward to receive our offering. <clears throat> John David, would you lead us in prayer? Appreciate it. Heavenly Father, well, thank you. Thank you that we are here able to celebrate Father's Day. Mm. We thank you for the fathers that you have given to us. But ultimately, Lord, we are thankful for you as our Heavenly Father. Mm -hmm. Allow this time to be a time of worship, worship to you for who you are, Lord, and you show yourself to be a good, good Father. Mm -hmm. But thank you for all your provision you have blessed us with. Be with us as we give right now and use it for your kingdom and your glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. you. may be seated. <laughs>
Let's stand for the doxology. Unless you're in the choir, you may be seated. better live always I tell you there were those days those few weeks that we actually shut down church during the height of the pandemic and I preached to a camera lens behind this pulpit and I tell you I sure like having people to preach to that are with me and worshiping uh, that was a challenge in those days and I'm so thankful they're over we need to praise the Lord for what he has done in giving health and strength to us as a nation and hopefully information, dispelling fear 
And uh, we're not a we're not a people of fear, are we? God doesn't give us a spirit of fear. If uh, fear comes, it comes from some other source and we have to recognize it as that and we have to bring God's word to bear upon it. We do have fears. Uh, There's actually that natural fear that God has placed in all of us to help keep us alive because he wants us to stick around for a while for his sake. Uh, I always tell people that's don't feel guilty about that kind of fear. God put that in you like a car's coming straight at you. That's an important kind of fear to have to move out of the way or you get a scary health diagnosis. That is people say, well, you don't have faith because you're scared. No, that's natural fear that God put in us. Where do we take it? We take it to the Lord and we hear what he has to say about it. Nehemiah chapter one. That's uh, just bonus preaching since I've got a few extra minutes today. (laughs) Yesterday was Juneteenth, and I am so thankful that in this country we set the captives free. And uh, we celebrate with all of our brothers in this country. We believe in freedom. And I'm sorry that they didn't have the same freedoms that we had from the beginning. And I'm glad that they do now. Let's just get out of the way and let what is beautiful and what works and is what's wondrous about America work in everybody's lives. And We'll be grateful for that, won't we? Nehemiah 1.1, the words of Nehemiah, the son of Hachaliah. It came to pass in the month Chislu, which is somewhere around November, November to December, if we're looking at our calendar, in the 20th year, as I was in Shushan the palace, that Hanani, one of my brethren, came, he and certain men of Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews that had escaped which were left of the captivity and concerning Jerusalem. And they said unto me, the remnant that are left of the captivity, that's the Babylonian captivity, there in the providence are in great affliction and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down. The gates thereof are burned with fire. And it came to pass when I heard these words, I sat down and I wept and I mourned certain days and I fasted. I took away all of the things that we think are important in this life so that I could focus on the higher reality. That's all fasting is about, is forgetting the earthly and focusing on the higher reality. I fasted and I prayed before the God of heaven. Now this takes place or took place on, in the 20th year of Artaxerxes, the king of Persia. Some of you say oh, we're going to have a history lesson. Well, a little bit, if you don't mind. Uh, Remember, Jeremiah had warned that God's people would go into captivity, into Babylonian captivity. The reason was clear. They turned from God. They had allowed themselves to be at the center of worship. They were still worshiping. They still used scripture. It's just that all of it had been assembled around them instead of around God. They allowed themselves to be the focus of Holy Scripture. Help us. It's not a manual for me and my living. It's a manual to reveal God to me, which impacts my living. (coughs) Jeremiah 1 16, the word of the Lord said, I will utter my judgments against them concerning all their wickedness. Jeremiah 2, beginning of verse 2, Jeremiah is told, go cry in the ears of Jerusalem saying, thus saith the Lord, I remember the kindness of your youth, the love of thine espousals. When we were young and we first got married is what God is saying to his people. Remember what that was like. Thou, when thou wentest after me in the wilderness in a land that was not sown, Israel was holiness unto the Lord. Israel was trusting me as they went through the Red Sea into the wilderness. I remember our wedding day. I remember how committed you were to me. Oh, the love we had. I hope you don't hear those words in your marriage. Oh, the love we had when we were married. And now look what's happened. And I, you know me, I had the testimony. It's stronger now than it's ever been before. And it's true. Then in Jeremiah 9, Jeremiah is weeping for his people. Y'all know Jeremiah was called the weeping prophet. I'm, I'm reminded of dad every time I slam his seminary ring against something. He, he wanted me to have that when he was gone. I'm glad I do. Jeremiah is weeping for his people. He wants to escape and go away to a lodging place in the wilderness. Can you relate to that? I just want to go off into the desert. 
I was just telling, I think, Carl, that my dad, when we would go on vacation, wanted to go west. He wanted to go into the desert. My dad was a pastor. He wanted to get away from civilization and from people. Ah, sometimes we need that, don't we? Amen. Jeremiah 9, 2, that I might leave my people and go from them, for they're all adulterers. They bend their tongues like their bow for lies, but they're not valiant for the truth upon the earth. Let's get brave about the truth. Let's sing about the faith of our fathers who died for the truth. Let's think about Martin Luther who risked everything. What can they do? Kill the body? They can't take my soul. They were not valiant for the truth on the earth. Let's raise up a generation that is valiant for the truth upon the earth. I want to be a part of, I know my generation's getting older, but I want to be a part of that. They are not valiant for the truth, Jeremiah said, upon the earth. They proceed from evil to evil, and they don't know me, saith the Lord. They're not in that intimate relationship with me. God remembers when they were. Jeremiah's call to return to holiness. Listen to the call and reaction in Jeremiah 18, 11, and 12. I know we're in Nehemiah, but we'll get back to that in a moment. Jeremiah 18, 11, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I frame evil against you and devise a device against you. In other words, judgment is coming. Return you now, everyone, from his evil ways and make your doings good. And listen to what they said. There is no hope. We will walk after our own devices. We will do every, the, everyone will do the imagination of his own evil heart. What a horrible reaction. God's saying, come back to me. Be my holy people. And the people of God who claim to be his people are saying, no, we're all just going to follow our own evil hearts. Just give up, Jeremiah, on us being a holy people. The same people who said, we'll keep on sinning and we can't help it. And Jeremiah 18, 18 said, come, let us devise devices against Jeremiah. For the law shall not perish from the priest, nor counsel from the wise, nor the word from the prophet. Come, let us smite him with the tongue and let us not listen to anything he says. The most popular preachers of their day were saying the same things they were. You can't live a holy life. You can't live for God. They gave comfort to the backsliders. They were saying it, it's impossible to do God's will. Well, Jesus is saying my yoke is easy and my burden is light. They were saying, no, it's a burden we can't bear. It's impossible. We can't do it. And listen, God is so merciful. He is so forgiving and he will welcome you back with open arms. If you've sinned against him, don't misunderstand me. But he says, you can live for me. You can trust me. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. Why have we gotten the idea that his will is so difficult and so impossible? That's the message they were hearing. And they were idolaters. They put everything ahead of God. They put everything ahead of God. They had become an idolatrous people. And whenever Babylon came and took them captive... Guess what? They were in I Idol Central because Babylon was the place of idols. He says, you want to put things before me? I'll show you what happens when you put things before me. But men like Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you've heard those names if you grew up in church. Men like that, they were real, willing to face the fire willing to go through whatever they had to go through to stand up for what's right. Even the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar was influenced by men like Daniel. So, said, wow, this, this God he serves, it's different. This God he serves, it's different than the gods we serve. But his son, Belteshazzar, in Daniel 5, threw a big party served out of the instruments that were supposed to be set aside for God's use in the temple. They'd taken them captive and taken them to Babylon. He sent for the instruments of worship and he had a big party and they got drunk and, and they celebrated mocking the things of God. 
the king had a dream. And you may have heard about it. You've heard an expression that comes from it. The dream was this big hand appeared and started writing on the wall. Nobody knew what it wrote. The handwriting on the wall. You've heard that expression. That's where it comes from. And it frightened everybody. Daniel was called to interpret the dream. He called the, the king out for his idol worship and the words he interpreted. Mene, mene. Uh, i got to find it. Tiko you farson. Not words I use every day. <laughs> mene. God has numbered your kingdom and it is finished. It's over. That's what Daniel said. Wow. Talk about guts coming to the king and say, your kingdom is over because of what you've done. Tico, you are weighed in the balance and you are found wanting. Oh God, don't, don't make that pronouncement of us. You've been weighed in the balance and found wanting, lacking. You farce and thy kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. You'll notice here in Nehemiah, it's a Persian king, not a Babylonian king. That night, the Persians came and this king died as the Persians took over the Babylonians. The Persian king took power where we are in Nehemiah is at the time of Artaxerxes, the son of the Artaxerxes that married Esther. If you're familiar with some of that, maybe you saw a movie about that. One night with the king. How God used her. The book of Nehemiah and the book of Esther, if placed chronologically, would actually be flip flop. But God's not always given us things in chronological order. He gives it in the importance of how he wants to express himself to us. That confuses a lot of people, but it has a great purpose. Ezra comes first and records the great prophetic fulfillment when Cyrus, the king of Persia, gave the order to rebuild Jerusalem. He said, go ahead, rebuild your city. What a grand celebration that was. And the first wave of Jews came back to the city. Some 40 years later, Esther came to her place in history at a crucial and dangerous time in that rebuilding project. I love the question that Mordecai, Mordecai asked her. He was her cousin, but he was much older than her and had adopted her when her parents were dead. Esther was basically his daughter. It says in Esther 4, 14, Who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this? Maybe you've come to this time and this place in history for the kingdom's sake. I would say we all have. We all have. Maybe you've come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Instead of cursing the darkness, as they say, light a candle. If you want to see the, these things chronologically, look at Ezra, then Esther, and then Nehemiah. So Nehemiah had most likely never seen Jerusalem himself, but he was standing on the foundation of those who went before him. Restoring God's truth and God's way. I hope that as you were singing those old hymns today, you noticed that there was a theme. It had to do with the truth of God and standing for the truth. As Jeremiah said, they're not valiant for the truth on the earth. So, Got to stay on track. At camp, I told the senior campers that I was a second generation Christian. And how valuable and how important that was in my life. And what do I mean by second generation? Well, my mom and dad didn't know the Lord and never known much about God were pagan. <laughs> Best way to describe it. Somebody witnessed to my dad. He came to the Lord. He came to the Lord when his marriage was a shambles and my mother couldn't take it anymore and had taken a vacation from the marriage and gone back to mama. And he stood alone in the bedroom after a layperson had witnessed to him about Jesus Christ. And he held up his Bible, held up my mom's Bible off of the dresser and said, I wish that I could read and understand this. And through the witness of that layperson, not a preacher, to somebody that just goes to church and loves the Lord, witnessed in, in his life. And he at that night surrendered his life to the Lord Jesus Christ in 1959. I was born January 1960. My mother, by her own description, was an urchin. She wasn't wanted by her family. She saw suicide in her family. She saw alcohol abuse in her family. She saw sexual deviance in her own home. 
And then at the age of 12, she was adopted by somebody who took her to the Lutheran church. And in Lutheran Sunday school, she came to know the Lord and had a real living faith. So my point was, I'm so thankful that there was somebody who laid some groundwork before me and I was taken to church when I was born, when I was just a few months old or less. I went to church conferences when I was, they were still having to warm my formula or whatever they did back in those days. <laughs> what a blessing to be a second generation. Didn't mean I was saved because my parents were. And then I had blessed opportunity that they didn't have. So thankful. My mom and dad were what I call pioneers in the faith. My dad was a great pioneer in the faith. He came to know, he got a lot of answers that weren't available to him. He says, I want to know. He was faithful in rebuilding, rebuilding the walls. My dad came from profanity. My dad came from, you name it. He'd rather go fishing and, and gamble than to go to church. He's one of those selfish ones that probably said, I can worship better out on the lake. That is a worship of self, not a worship of God. Until he came to Christ. Ezra stood for the restoration of the God-centered word. Esther and Nehemiah showed the response of rebuilding in light of that word. We need it. We need the walls to be rebuilt. We need families to be reordered and changed to be after God's pattern. Wasn't the generation before me, but my dad was called to start rebuilding the walls. And I want you to know I couldn't be more thankful for my dad who's in heaven now who rebuilt the walls that we need, that I needed so desperately. The walls of Jerusalem symbolize what must happen in the family and in the church and then in society. We can't see a restoration of family values unless we understand God's vital use of the family. We can call all day because we like the way it used to be and we can call for old family values. They'll never happen until we understand how God designed the family and why. We'll never get there. There are a lot of people that are saying, I'm for old-fashioned family values, but they don't know why. They just know those were better days for them. They have no idea why. We must restore the whys. There can be no lasting change until there's a depth of understanding. We'll never, never rebuild the walls until we understand their value and their purpose, what they're there for. It's only when we understand the purpose that we truly grieve the loss. As Nehemiah sat down and he wept because the walls were broken down. He understood the value of the walls, protection. The walls were there to protect and to declare. Our family walls are there to, to protect the family, it's a precious place when we do it God's way. It's a, it's a place of security. It's a, a place that I cannot describe to you how it felt to know that mom and dad loved God and they loved each other. It was a place of security for me. But we'll never rebuild the walls unless we understand the purpose of them. Jerusalem was a place of safety. We're going to do it God's way. We're going to, and you study the 12 gates of, of the city. It speaks of truth. It speaks of important principles. We're not going into that today, but the walls represented the truth of God. Look at verse 3 again, Nehemiah 1. They said to me, the remnant that are left of the captivity there in the providence, they're in great affliction, reproach. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down. The gates are ever burned with fire. Can you apply that to the family today? to the churches today. It came to pass when I heard these words, I sat down and wept and I mourned certain days and I fasted and prayed before the God of heaven because he understood the reason for them. The first thing he does, he prays. It becomes personal. Verse 5, And I said, I beseech thee, O Lord God of heaven, the great and terrible God. And we use the word terrible a little bit differently. That means to be held in the highest regard. Sometimes we use the word awesome, but I think it's been so overused that we need another word, don't we? 
You're so high. You're so valuable. You're so important above all other things. Great and terrible God, it keeps covenant and mercy for them that love him and observe his commandments. Let thine ear be attentive and thy eyes open that thou mayest hear the prayer of your servant, which I pray now day and night for the children of Israel, thy servants. And listen, I'm going to confess the sins of my generation and the generation before me, the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against thee. Both I and my father's house have sinned. There's been a failure of my generation. There's been a failure of the previous generation to uphold these things. I admit it. I understand. We're not standing up for the truth anymore. We're not valiant for the truth, which gives us the reason for the family. God, help us. God is to be respected above all else. When we realize it's about Him, we join Him in His purpose, in His program. It's not about me and my happiness. It's about Him. When we recognize the purpose and its value, then we work. And of course, the enemy becomes aware and they had enemies, didn't they? Look at chapter 4 and verse 6. And so we built the wall. Praise the Lord. Nehemiah 4, 6, we built the wall and all the wall was joined together under the half thereof. For the people had a mind to work. They wanted to. They saw the value of it. Verse 7, but it came to pass that when Sanballat and Tobiah and the Arabians and the Ammonites and the Ashtadites heard that the walls of Jerusalem were, were being restored, the breaches began to be stopped. They were angry. And they conspired all of them to gather to come and to fight against Jerusalem and to hinder it. Nevertheless, we made our prayer under our God and we set a watch against them day and night because of them. Satan is aware if there's a rebuilding project, this is not good. The world that wants to feel free and uncondemned in their sin says this is not good. We will fight against this. We will not allow these walls to be rebuilt. The enemy's coming, and we have to be aware. We made our prayer to God, and we set a watch. And dads, we better set a watch, hadn't we? About what the enemy is trying to do to our homes, to our families. Nehemiah had a position of authority. Did y'all notice that? I was the king's cupbearer. That would be like today saying I was the chief of staff for the president of the United States. You wanted to see the president, you came through me. I want to explain all of that, but he also ate food because he would die instead of the, the king if it had poison in it. But it was a very honored position. It was a very trusted position, as you can imagine. As Cindy's heard me say on the golf course as she's learning to play golf better and better, I said, with power comes responsibility. <laughs> because if you hit it just about 20 yards, it doesn't matter if you hit it straight or not. But if you're going to hit it 300 yards like I have at times, not much anymore, but 300 yards, it matters whether it's off a little bit to the left or right, Carl. Amen? Amen. With power comes responsibility. And that's true. We've discussed the principle where there's power for good, there's power for harm. When God created the power to, to love him by free will forever, what did he create? The potential for sin, the potential for men not to love him. That which promised and made the opportunity for the greatest thing that could ever be, heaven and God and the greatest relationship he could ever had, threatened the greatest tragedy that could ever be. Sin and hell. With power comes responsibility. It's a frightening thing. Used in the negative, isn't it? We're creating His image, the potential. I tell young couples when I'm counseling them for marriage, the same principle is true. This has the potential to be the greatest love relationship you'll ever experience outside of your relationship with God. Therefore, it threatens the greatest tragedy and heartache you could ever experience. And I've been through it. I've been through it with the good ones. I've been through it with the bad ones. 
where somebody or both decided not to do it God's way, and it is the worst tragedy that a home could ever see, an individual could ever see. And if you know somebody who's been a, a victim of a broken marriage, love them and pray for them and encourage them because they've just gone through the worst thing you could ever experience in life. But it, it takes two, doesn't it? You're taking a chance when you get married. What if that person doesn't live up to their commitment? With the potential, there comes the potential for great harm. The same is true of spiritual leadership. God designed the father role to be the head, the greatest influence. God designed it that way for his purpose, to say something about him. And dads wield this power whether they like it or not. Whether they admit it or not, they wield this power. Fortunately, Nehemiah recognized his power that it could be used for good. And so Nehemiah turned to God. He got on his knees and he sought God. And he said, oh God, I can't do this without you. The same power God has given to build up, to instill confidence, is the power to tear down and destroy. Listen to statistics. Maybe you've heard something like this before. I just want to give you a few of them with the few minutes that I'll take. These statistics come from places like the U.S. Department of Health. I'm not going to tell you where all the sources are. Center for Disease Control, the National Principal Association, the U.S. Department of Justice, the State Department of Corrections, and on and on. I give you those sources so that you won't think this is some convoluted information. Maybe you do since it's government, but that's another story, isn't it? But they got it right this time. Probably the numbers are worse than what I'm about to read. 63% of youth suicides are from fatherless homes. That's five times the average. 90% of homeless and runaways are from fatherless homes. 32 times the average. 85% with behavior disorders, 20 times the average, come from fatherless homes. This isn't taking into account bad fathers. This is fatherless homes. You had the bad ones in there. And it's a, we can't imagine the consequences to our society and the cost. 80% of rape, rapists come from fatherless homes. 71% of high school dropouts come from fatherless homes. Those with fathers are 70% less likely to drop out. 75% of all adolescent patients in chemical abuse centers are from fatherless homes. 75%. 68% are more likely to smoke, drink, or use drugs. 68% more. 70% of youth in state-operated institutions are from fatherless homes. 85% of all youth in prison are from fatherless homes. 85%. What is the cost on society that we've turned our back on God, men? What is the cost to society that we ignore the role of the man in the home? We could go on with teen pregnancy, with divorce. Here's kind of an off the wall one. 90% of teen repeat arsonists are from fatherless homes. 90% out burning things down. The walls are crumbling when fathers don't act according to God's design. We are in a power position, whether we like it or not. God designed it to operate that way because we're here to represent Him. We're here to represent Christ. We're to love our wives as Christ loved the church. My dad was right. He said, I can do a lot of things wrong if I love the children of my, my children's mother. I do a lot right. He was right. He said, you can mess up big time in many ways. If you love their mother, it makes up for a lot of wrong turns. We make mistakes, don't we? What I tell people when I'm counseling marriage, you got to put God first. 
Nehemiah 12, 43, they offered great sacrifices and rejoiced for God had made them rejoice with great joy. The wives also and the children rejoiced so that the joy of Jerusalem was heard afar off. I love it. What I tell couples, this is the triangle. If you've been around here long, you've heard me at least talk about it. God's at the top of the triangle. Men and women, at the bottom of the triangle. The world's way is men and women to try to get close to each other. It doesn't work. You miss each other. I want to mention a preacher, but <laughs> there's a preacher that I heard preaching one day about these things. And I said, this sounds vaguely familiar. And you know, he was one that I had the counseling of his marriage when he was a young man. And he would say, you know, the preacher, whenever I was getting married, I thought he was crazy. I thought this. And he's sharing these same principles with his large congregation now in Waco, Texas. You'll miss each other if you try with men's efforts to get close to each other. It doesn't work. I don't care if you have a trail of roses to the bathroom or, or the bedroom. I don't care what you try and whether you go on two honeymoons or three honeymoons. I don't care what you try. It will not work until you start getting closer to God on your own, yourself. Work towards God and quit saying they messed up and they're not doing this and I'm sick and tired of this. You start getting closer to God. And if she'll do the same thing, you'll be closer to each other. It's infallible. It works every time. Let the joy of God's ways be known for his sake as we rebuild the walls. Let's rebuild the walls. I said, I'm a second generation Christian. My wife is a first generation Christian. She comes from dysfunction. She comes from all kinds of evil that Satan will accomplish in a person's life and home. And the damage that that causes, she could testify firsthand. But she came to Christ. Then mom came to Christ. And then dad came to Christ. And then sisters and not in that order, but sisters came to Christ. She doesn't have any brothers. They're brothers-in-law. They came to Christ. And boy, was our family transformed. So we rebuilt the walls. And we're so thankful. Problems, yes. Difficulties, yes. Teenagers, yes. <laughs> but the only way you'll ever make it is through Him. Let's, let's sing, Paul, if you can make it up here with that. Surgery arm. Aren't y'all glad that he's here today? He had surgery on Tuesday, I think it was. <laughs> he's Your prayers, thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Let's sing number 210. Jesus paid it all. 210.
connection oftentimes with whoever wrote these hymns and we may not know who they are and oftentimes we do know who they are I mean we have their names but we may not know much about them I love that last part when before the throne I stand in Christ complete Jesus died my soul to say my lips will still repeat he did it all he made it possible he led me all the way I can't take any of the credit. He deserves all the glory for anything good that came out of me. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your blessing, of your presence, of your Holy Spirit. Thank you for men like Nehemiah, willing to take a chance, lose his job, go to the king, but the need for the walls to be rebuilt in Jerusalem, to be rebuilt in my house, to be rebuild, rebuilt in our church. And Father, what a testimony when things are built your way. Help us to build your way. Help us to be valiant for the truth upon the earth. Help us to be like Martin Luther was in his generation. No matter what it costs, I'm going to be valiant for the truth on the earth. No matter what it costs, I'm going to wield my power, the opportunity I have for good. Help us, Lord. Help us to be a Joseph. Help us to be a Daniel. Help us to be an Esther. By your grace, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.